If you've ever struggled to make a nice nav bar or navigation for a site where you have a mobile version, something like this that can slide in and out and then it grows and we get a different looking one like that, well, then you're in the right place because that's exactly what we're going to be looking at in this video. Hello, my friend and friends, and welcome back for yet another video. I'm so glad that you've come to join me once again. And if you're new here, my name is Kevin, and here at my channel, I help you fall in love with CSS, and if not fall in love with it, at least to be a little bit less frustrated by it. And navigations are one of those things that well, they're pervasive. They're on every single website pretty much. And they're pretty small components. You know, they just sit up there at the top of the site and people scroll away pretty fast and don't look at them very much. They're just, there's a lot going on with them and they can take quite a while to put together and to make look good. And especially when you need to make them responsive and look different at different screen sizes. So we're going to be exploring all of that in this video. But just before we dive into it, I want to let you know that this is from a project on Front End Mentor. We're only going to be looking at the navigation in this one, and not everything else. But if you'd like to build out the whole project, all the assets, everything you need are there. And it's part of their new free plus tier where you get access to everything, including all the Figma files. And if you'd like to follow along and build out the entire site with me, I also did this as a completely free course over on Scrimba. Once again, the link is down below, but I'll talk more about that later. For now, let's jump in and work on this navigation that we have here. So here is where we're going to be starting with. You'll see there's already a few things that have been done. There's a lot of CSS in this file already. Uh, just because I really want to focus only on the navigation itself and not on doing other things. So I'm not styling specifically like how I did the font size on the text here. And that's actually because this is from another project I did, which is a completely free course where we did this entire site over on Scrimba. Um, but I want to sort of make this agnostic of that course and just focus more on getting the navigation to work so you could do this on your own project that looks completely different and everything should still fall into place and sort of give you some hints and tips with some modern CSS techniques to get all of that done. Wardrobe change because Kevin from the future is here and as I was editing this video I realized I forgot something important which was the main structure here and I didn't go over it because it is very simple even though it looks like there's a lot happening and that's basically because I have a lot of classes uh, on my links uh, but basically this is what I have and just really fast let me update this. So basically the structure of my navigation is the same you see everywhere. I have a nav class that has a UL in there. Uh, in the UL, I have my list items. And for each list item, there is a link. And inside my links here, I have, um, I used a span for them uh, that you can see right here. So I have a span with these 03 and area hidden. We're gonna talk more about that when we get to the stage of uh, why I, I did that when we style up these numbers. Uh, but it's just the same structure you'd always see. Nav, then a UL, then my LIs, and then my links inside of there. So there's nothing fancy, even though well, I do have all of those classes in there. All of those classes that you see are really just to style the text to make it look a certain way. It has nothing to do with the navigation itself. So we're all starting at the same place and you should be able to use everything I'm doing here to style things up. Importantly, I did put my class of prim primary navigation on the UL and not the nav itself, just because this is what I tend to be selecting as I go through. So I just chose to make that decision. You might have to structure or change your selectors a little bit uh, when you're writing your CSS, but you should be able to take pretty much most of what we're doing here and apply it to your own projects. So let's go and dive in to the rest of it now. Uh, so I'm starting in my primary header here. So one thing that's really important is you'll notice that these guys are already next to one another. And that's because what I have already done, and I've used quite a few utility classes, is I have a flex utility class. The only thing that that's doing, let's turn it off and you'll see they go like that. And if I put flex on, they go next to one another. Uh, and I'm also using that on my UL here. So on my UL, if we go look, I've given it a class of primary navigation, but I've also said the flex just to get them to go next to one another like that. But I basically haven't done anything else. Or I haven't, I literally haven't done anything else other than, you know, changing a little bit of the styling on the text on these guys. And so we just have a display flex on them to get next to each other. Uh, and one more thing that I have actually done on that, let's go and find that flex class. I have set a gap on there and the gap is using this gap custom property, which is a non-existing custom property. It's not one that I've defined in my root. So that means it falls back to this one. So if I change this number to two, you'll see they spread out even more. Or I could change it to a five and they're gonna spread out even more. 
So I can just change this custom property where I need to in specific areas and the gap in that place will adjust. And we're gonna bring that back to the default of one. And there's nothing else that I've done in here that is important for the navigation itself. So let's get started with it. So the first thing we're gonna do is, right now my logo is stuck to the side and I sort of want to allow that to happen to a certain extent, but I'm just gonna choose my logo, which is inside my primary header, which is why I'm, I'm putting it under that comment that's right there. Uh, and for this one, I'm just gonna come in with a margin and I'm just, we'll start with like a 2M, but we're going to play with this number a little bit as we go. But that sort of set things up a little bit nicer. Uh, the only thing is I want to make sure that at large screen sizes anyway, and we will be taking more of a mobile first approach. I just want to sort of set the stage a little bit. Um, we can align this right there. So I can just say that my dot primary header has uh, an align content of center and not content, align items before I hit save on that and hit save, and because it is using flex, they're lined up that way. Um, and the other thing, I mean, I said we wanna do this mobile first, but we can throw this guy all the way over to the other side nice and quickly here, just by doing then a justify content space between, and then it shoots off all the way to the other side. I'm not gonna worry about all the styling that goes into the rest of that, but there are a few things here that will be um, pretty sort of standard. So I'm gonna choose my primary navigation, which is the class I have on the UL itself. So the primary header has my image in it, or my logo, as well as my full nav, and the UL itself here has the primary navigation class on it. So I'm gonna choose that primary navigation class and just say that it has a list style of none, and we can also give this a padding of zero and a margin of zero. Now you could use a utility class um, to do something like that, but this is just sort of a general reset that I almost always run on these things to get them to look the way I need them to. Um, so we'll throw that on there and then we'll keep on going a little bit. And if I'm gonna pull up the Figma design, which I have off screen, and you know what, I, I wanna leave it on screen a little bit. So I'm just gonna pull that up so it's like that. Um, just because while we're here, these numbers are bold and then these ones here are not bold. So I am going to do that right away. Uh, I realize this is probably, I said we're gonna stick to things that are more unique to your own that are more universal, but there's a few interesting lessons I think that we can do um, in setting that up. Uh, so if we go and look at how I did that, I did come in here on these, um, I did come in here and let me just turn word wrap on so we can see it a little bit easier. Uh, so I have my LI itself. Um, and then here I have a bunch of classes that just studying up my font styles. And then I have the text itself. So the zero zero home. And on the zero zero, I have done, that's all in my span. So I did a span and then the span has an area hidden of true on it, of zero zero. And then I have the home that's right there uh, for the regular text. And the reason I did this is while the numbers here are convenient, they look good. They're a nice sort of visual clue as to what's going on. They don't, you wouldn't want that read out to you if you were on a screen reader where it'd be saying zero zero home, zero one destination, zero two crew and all of that. It's a visual clue for us so we can quickly look, but because it's bold, we can make that quick visual distinction. So the area hidden on there makes it so a screen reader won't actually read that out loud, which makes that for a better experience. Um, so that's just why I did that. And because it's in a span, I can sort of go in and select that a little bit. We need to style these uh, a little bit more anyway. So let's jump back over to here. And we can say that my primary navigation and first, I'm just going to choose the links themselves. I'm going to say text decoration of none on there. So the text decoration is turned off. And we want my primary navigation a span. And that is a lot of descendant selectors. So you could come and argue that maybe this should be a class on here. Uh, and, you know, could be a valid argument for that. But because of the nature of how this navigation is built, it's set up in such a specific way that you need to have a span on that and it's always gonna have the area hidden on it. Um, and even if you wanted to, if you wanted to sort of enforce that area hidden, you could even do this instead, which I didn't think of at the time, but we could say an area hidden is equal to true and uh, true. And let's just look at the whole code there. Um, and this is an attribute selector. So this would really reinforce somebody setting up the navigation properly, or if they say they needed to add a, a 04 or a 05, and it would enforce that they're using the area hidden true for the numbers. So this is kind of an interesting thing that I never thought of until just now. So we're gonna stick with that and just say that the font weight is 700 to make it nice and bold. And we can throw a margin on here, and I'm gonna do a margin inline 
And margin inline is left and right. This is a logical property. And it means that if the writing direction were changed because you're doing a multilingual site or it's being translated, that the uh, it goes in the right direction. So we can say a margin inline end, which would be my margin right. It's longer to write, but logical properties are the best. So I'm gonna throw that on there. Maybe like a 0.5 M or something like that. And look at that, it's coming together. Maybe this could even be a little bit bigger. I'm just sort of eyeballing it right now. But there we go, it's starting to come together pretty nicely. So let's just shrink this back down. And I said we're taking more of a mobile first approach. So let's go and look at what the mobile navigation would look like, which will be something that looks like this here when it's opened and when it's closed, it will look something like that. And so to do that, we're gonna start with styling things up so it looks like that, including our background and everything. We'll build the functionality of that in and then we'll come back and make it work at larger screen sizes and sort of work our way back up. So for that, that means that my primary navigation itself does need a few more things on it. And so to do this, what it means is I would, we could come in my primary navigation and I said we're doing mobile first. So I could come and I wanna do a position fixed on this so I can really lock it in where it goes. So I could do it here. But one thing with navigations is there's so many different pieces that we have to overwrite between going from something that looks like this to something that looks like this. It's one of the very few times that I actually come in and use a max width media query. I do not use these very often, but this is one of those situations just because there's so many conflicting styles, I don't have to overwrite things too much. So by using a max width, it's only gonna be at the small sizes and later I'll have a min width one that will only be for the larger sizes and just means you can write less CSS overall. So let's come in with an app media. I'm gonna do a min width of 35M and then we're going to give the size that we want. Um, and then we have to come in with the selector that we want, which is my primary navigation, just like that. Um, I'm using 35M just because I find it works well for the design and for this breakpoint. That's why I chose it. There's nothing else magical to that. And so primary navigation, what do we want? As I said, we want a position of fixed on there because no matter what, and the page that we're creating now, it won't actually scroll, um, and this whole project, it wouldn't. But if you had a navigation like this, you wanna make sure once it comes out, like if somebody does scroll and you don't prevent scrolling, you want the navigation to still be there. So that will help with this. Now you would normally, with a position fixed, give a top, bottom, left, and right. Another logical property that we now have is inset. And this is just a shorthand, it's like margin. Margin is a shorthand for margin, top, bottom, left, and right. Inset is a shorthand for top, bottom, left, and right. And so we can uh, say inset, I want zero on the top, zero on the right, zero on the bottom, and say 30% maybe on the left side. And let's give this a background so we can actually see it. Background, we'll say it's a steel blue, which we'll change after, but there we go. We can see the 30%. So if I made that 10%, it means it's 10% off the side there. 30% will be 30% off. Now it doesn't look fantastic, but let's open up my dev tools and we'll open up responsive mode by clicking this little guy right here. And then let's go and undock it just so this isn't in the way during the demo and I'll pull it over if ever I wanna highlight something. But just remember this is only gonna be at my smaller sizes. And I said we're gonna use a max width and I'm so used to writing min width that I wrote min width. Look at that, there we go. So we're gonna have that style is going to apply until we get to here and then it turns off for the larger size. So that's good. What else could we do here? Well, right now these are going across this way and I want them to stack on top of each other up and down. So my primary navigation already has a display of flex on it. So we can come in and say that it has a flex direction of column, which will make the children rows and then they stack on top of each other. Super duper. Uh, another thing that we could do on here is add some padding. So I'm gonna say padding and we need padding on all the sides. So we could say something like, if you look at the, the finished version, we have a lot on the top and then some on there and then the bottom, it doesn't really matter because it hopefully will never fill up that whole space. Um, so for the top, let's just say for now, we'll do like, I don't know, 10 rem just to see where that puts us and then maybe two rem left and right. And maybe that's a little bit too much on the top, but it's not too bad. But I think one thing that could be kind of cool is, you know, if somebody rotates their device, and I don't know who would have a weird device like this, but now it looks kind of ugly. So an interesting thing we can do with the padding here, instead of using that, is using a min function. And so I could say a minimum between two different values, and it's gonna choose the smaller of the two. So let's say we do 20 viewport height, comma, and we say 10 rem. And then it's going to choose whichever is smaller, and maybe this should, mm, maybe this could be 30, just to see what happens. Um, so now you can see it's not glued to the top anymore, but as this shrinks, that space is actually getting smaller and smaller. 
So it's actually going with this 30VH because 30VH is smaller than 10 rem. And then as I increase that, it's gonna grow, 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 but then it's gonna lock in once we get to 10, because now 10 is smaller than 30VH. So it becomes a little bit more dynamic. And yeah, I think that works really well. And it's one of the use cases I really like using the min function for, is for padding uh, in different situations like that. And I think that looks pretty good. So we have a few things to do. Let's start with our background, because I think everybody likes these background effects. And I'm, I will put a background on here. I'm gonna use an HSL. Uh, if you don't know why I'm using HSL, there's a card popping up or a link in the description where I go further into the world of HSL. Uh, but I'm just going to put zero for the color because it doesn't matter. I'll put zero percent for the saturation because the saturation doesn't matter because I'm going to go with white, which is 100% on the lightness. And if I hit save, it'd be pure white. But then I can do a forward slash and do like a 0.1 or something like that and bring in a transparent background. So that's always fun. So that's nice and fun. Uh, if you do this with the comma syntax, which is the older color syntax, instead of the hyphen here, or the hyphen, the forward slash, uh, you could do it just like that with the regular HSL. And you don't need an HSL A even with the transparency. Um, it will work either way. But I'm going to set it up like that, uh, even though we're going to have to change this in a second. But we have my HSL, which gives me a light background. And uh, when we come in with our back backdrop filter, and we'll write blur, and I'll put one M, uh, well, one rem, one M, it shouldn't really matter, and we can blur stuff. And the bigger this number, the more that it's actually gonna be blurred, or the smaller the number, the less blurred it's going to be. And I'm gonna go with a one, but you could play with that number and do what you want with it. Uh, and I think that looks really good, except one problem I have is that large screen sizes, it goes away and it comes back. So this, we can actually take it out of here and bring it all the way up just to my regular one, because we need it at all our screen sizes. So we can have this right here, and now at large screens is there and at my small screens, it's also there. So that's perfect. Now we need to fix our padding and a few other things here. That's okay, we're gonna get there. But right here, everything is working nicely. One thing though with this is not all browsers support it. Firefox has it behind a flag right now, meaning if somebody were to come and visit this and be on Firefox, it would instead look like this, which isn't terrible. Um, but depending on the backgrounds that you have or the positioning of different things, like here when this gets bigger, it becomes a little bit hard to read what's actually happening there. So if you are using a backdrop filter, I'd really recommend looking at what it looks like without it because it could make your text unreadable. The blur really helps text become a lot more readable on backgrounds when there's light and dark going on. And so turn it off and check or check in Firefox to see what's going on or if this is in the future, maybe it is supported in Firefox. So just to keep an eye on that, but what we could do is we could actually, I'm gonna copy this and I'm gonna come down and do an at supports. And in my at supports, we can write my uh, backdrop filter of my blur. And well, the one rem doesn't really matter. You just need to give it like the full, um, a full, you need to give it a property value pair basically. So my property value is whatever, as long as it's a valid property value pair, then you can put whatever you want in here. Uh, and supports works a lot like um, media queries. And if you'd like to know more on them and you've never seen them before, I have a video that covers them. The card should be popping up now. Or once again, there's a link in the description. So we have my primary navigation and then we can drop that on there. So this is if a browser supports it. And if a browser doesn't support it, we'll fall back to our default value here. And so I'm gonna bump this number up to like a point maybe 75. And we're gonna change this from 100 to zero. So this means it's completely black because I have a white text putting a, a black background on it, I think makes sense. And so if I save, you can actually see it's still using this because Chrome supports backdrop filter. But let's just turn this off to simulate what someone in Firefox would get. Of course, we could open it in Firefox, but there we go. If you're in Firefox, you get that, and maybe this could even be a little bit lower, but you, want to, you do wanna make sure um, and try all the different backgrounds and test your situation out. But something like that, I think looks decent. It's very readable, so I'm happy with that. And then on browsers that do support it, they get this, and that takes like no extra work whatsoever to do. And you know, that was what? Me explaining it didn't even take long. So supports is really, really handy for coming in with these cool things that maybe don't have the best browser support. Um, and yeah, so there we go. That's looking really good. Let's go back to Figma for a second, just to look at our design. And I think we're pretty close. Uh, one thing I do notice is there does seem to be more space between these than what we currently have there. So I think what we're gonna do is, let's shrink this down a little bit. And I'm gonna go back into my media query. And on my primary navigation, you remember I mentioned that we had that flex 
class that was also on there and that had the gap property. And so I'm gonna come on here and say that the gap is actually like a 2M and that should space things out more. And again, you can come in and make that three and it will space them out more. And this is one of the reasons that having gap supported across the board now um, with Flexbox is just so amazing. And I say across the board because I don't care about Internet Explorer and neither should you. And I mean like even this, the website you're watching this on right now on YouTube, it doesn't support Internet Explorer anymore. So uh, if you try going to YouTube in Internet Explorer 11, it will actually open it in Edge if you have Edge installed, I tested it and that's what happened. Uh, and they tell you that this website does not work. IE is like officially dead now. Just tell your boss that like Google, Microsoft, Netflix, yeah, I said Microsoft, even Microsoft has dropped support for Internet Explorer. So like it's, it's done. All the social networks, like everybody, they've stopped. So you don't have to be there, um, hopefully. I, and I know there's exceptions. There's always exceptions, but most things these days, you don't have to worry about it. Anyway, tangent there, let's get back to our navigation. Uh, the nice thing with this gap is if you're using Flexbox, it's gonna be the gap this way. And then if you switch the flex direction, it's the gap the other way. And so um, it's kind of cool that we can do that with Flexbox instead of worrying about like different mar you know, margin top bottom one way and then margin left right the other way. Just gap is a gap, which is wonderful uh, and makes life so easy. So there we go. That's looking pretty good, except we don't have a way to open and close it. <laughs> so let's build that in now. Um, and the way I'm gonna do that is, let's turn word wrap off just so it's a bit cleaner to look at. I have my header, I have a div, I have my nav, and I need this nav to disappear. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna come here and we're gonna add a button. And in my button, we're actually going to write some text when we write menu. And you might be saying, well, Kevin, I, well, look at that, it's behind my backdrop filter. <laughs> um, you might be saying, Kevin, I don't want the text menu there, but this is one of those things with accessibility. Once again, we did my area hidden, so the screen reader wouldn't read this. We can add here a span around this, so span, and we'll just grab menu and drag it right in the middle. And I will add a class here of SR only, which I also have in my CSS. Uh, and that's making this disappear. And if you'd like, a, I've put a link in the description below to uh, talk a little bit about what SR only does. Uh, it's a very common thing that you'll see used across sites all over the place that basically hides things from sighted users, but not from screen readers. So a screen reader would get to this button and it's gonna say menu and they'll have a better idea of what this actually does. Because if you didn't have any context and there was just like a, a, an image in here, let's say that which is your hamburger menu, a, a screen reader would have no idea what that is. So we can add this in nice and easily to give context when a screen reader is getting there and it sees this button, it's gonna know what the button does, which is to open and close your menu except we need to do a little bit more work on here to get that to actually be true. So you'll notice on my UL here, I have those classes, my primary navigation class and my FX class right there, but I also have an ID on here. And the reason I put the ID on this is because on this button, I'm gonna do an area controls is equal to, and we're gonna write in here primary navigation. And so this area controls is going to look for an ID. So it's saying that this button is controlling this. And if you don't know about area, it's once again, a way to give extra context to assistive technologies. And so uh, it's a really, we can really deep dive it. We're gonna touch on it a little bit. It's a little bit like this area hidden. We're saying that this is hidden from an assistive technology. Here we're saying to the assistive technologies that this controls this navigation here. So when we click on this menu, this is the menu that it's actually opening and closing. And we do want one more area on here, and this is gonna be an area of expanded is going to be equal to false because right now it actually is expanded, it's out. But when you first get to the site, we won't have it sticking out, right? When we first get to the site, we're gonna have a hamburger menu, so it isn't expanded. The menu is currently closed, but if I click on it, it's gonna to switch to area expanded is true, and our menu is actually going to slide out. And then if you click the X, vice versa, it goes to closed and it slides and closes once again. So my button is there now, it exists, and we actually need to get it to show up now, so I will do one more thing on this button and give this a class, and we'll just call it mobile nav toggle, because that's what it does. It toggles our menu open and closed. So let's turn WordWrap back on just so you can see everything there on the screen at once. We can put that span on its own line. Uh, there we go. And so we have my button with the class, area controls, what are we controlling? And is that opened or closed right now? And the default state when the page loads will be closed. And then we have my span inside of there where we can put that all on one line. 
uh, with the word menu and that's in an SR only. So it's visually hidden, but screen readers can still read that text. All right, so that's in place and we have the class here so we can actually style it up. So let's go and do that now. Let's shrink this back down, come over to my index. And the first thing, uh, let's actually, we'll come here and let's just say that the uh, mobile nav, and I'll explain why I'm doing it here, toggle in a second. Uh, we're gonna do a position absolute on this guy, position absolute. And when we do that, it's it's now, it's right here. So let's give that a, a background that's red so we can see it, red. Uh, I'll give it a width of one rem just for a moment. And I'll give it an aspect ratio of one, uh, which is the same as saying one over one, which is saying the width and the height are the same. So you can see I have a nice little square. And the reason I like that is if I change this to a two, the width and height both change at the same time. So it becomes very easy to manipulate and change because I want it to stay a square. Uh, and I'll come and I'm gonna say that the top is say two rem and my right side is a two rem. So it goes over to there, except we can barely see it because it's behind my entire menu right here. So we will also come and give this a Z index. And because this just should always be on top of everything, I like reserving 9999 for like just you're the king that's floating above everybody else. And there we go. We have my button that is on top of everything else. Uh, I forgot to do this here, but we should probably give this a Z index as well. It's not running into any issues now, but there's always the possibility of that. I want it to be pretty high. For me, a thousand is a pretty high layer, so I'm gonna go with that. So a thousand's really up high, and then 9999 is like the absolute highest. I usually work like one, 10, and I have like a list, you have like a 10, 20, 30 or whatever. And then you have like your next layer up, which is your hundreds. And then you can go to thousands. Um, so there's my button. Now we don't want it to be red like that. We actually want this to be a URL because Front End Mentor has provided us with some images. So let's go and get that. It's in my assets folder and then it's in my shared folder. And then from there it's icon hamburger, just like that. And there we go. It's sort of showing up, but not really. And so let's make this a bit bigger. We'll do a two on there. So it's a bit bigger. That looks a lot closer. Um, I'm actually gonna make this like a five just to show you what's happening. Because I set it as a background image, it's repeating itself to fill up the space over and over again. So on my background here, let's also come in with a background repeat of uh, no repeat. And so it doesn't actually repeat itself now, which makes more sense. And then we can drop this back down to a two. And there we go, my hamburger is in the right spot. Um, and is looking pretty good, except obviously we don't want any borders or anything like that on here. So here we can say border is zero as well to turn off the border that's on there. Awesome. So now we have a button that is there. Uh, it's just not, it's, it's not doing very much, but it's there <laughs> and we need it to actually do something now. Um, oh, and I did mention, um, I was putting this here because when I get to the large screen sizes, it's reappearing right now, uh, but I don't actually want it to reappear. We don't want that button there. We only want the button at the small size. So before we, we make the, the functionality come in, let's come all the way up, uh, logo, primary header, and let's put it right here. And we're just gonna say a display of none, which will completely remove it from the DOM. Uh, so of course we do that, that does mean in my media query where I have it, we'll also come in and say display block because that's perfectly fine. Um, so now it's a none here, so it doesn't exist at large sizes. And then when we get to here, it reappears and now we have our navigation that's right there, or our toggle, I should say. Awesome, so all of that is in place and now we can add the functionality, which does mean we need to go to a JavaScript file, which I've already done uh, and I've already linked it in my HTML. So I've done it. Um, in my head, but I've thrown a defer on there just so uh, it loads only once the page has loaded. So just if you're doing this on your own, don't forget to link your JavaScript file because I've debugged things for way longer than I'd like to admit just because my JavaScript file wasn't linked. So let's start with a few things that we need. First is the, uh, let's get the navigation itself. So my primary nav is going to be equal to document.query selector of uh, dot primary navigation. And I'll make this bigger while I'm writing some JavaScript, I think. So we're choosing the primary navigation and we're also gonna have a const of, uh, we'll call it nav toggle, should be fine. And that's my document.query selector. And on that is my dot mobile nav toggle. Awesome, so we have those in place. 
if you're not used to JavaScript, um, this is just making it so we can actually, like, we're saying, go look through my page and find my primary navigation. We're gonna call that item in this file, my primary nav. And then we're gonna go find my mobile nav toggle. We're gonna save that with the name nav toggle here, just so we don't have to write this out every single time. It's basically what we need that for. And one more thing I just thought of is when we're in our default state, we actually want the navigation to be hidden away. And when we click, it needs to slide out. So let's go to my CSS. And on my primary navigation, we're going to do one more thing here, which is going to be a transform. And we're going to do a translate, translate uh, x, y. x is up and down. No, x. Yeah, x. I always mix up x and y for whatever reason. Uh, and I think it's, I always mix up here too if it's positive or negative, but I do believe, let's do 50% and we'll see if we move it in the right direction. And there we go, it's going out the right way. So 50% is, means 50% of its own width to the right in this space. If we did a negative, it would go 50% of its own width the other way. So if I do 100% here, it's going to move 100% of its own width off the page. Uh, if ever this does, and it's, there's a potential of these types of things causing some overflow going on. So on the body itself, um, I have a body. Um, on the body itself, you could come in and say uh, overflow x of hidden, just to prevent any overflows that might happen if you find you're getting any. Just to throw that, because um, you know, often doing that is, is useful in general uh, anyway. So that is now slid completely off the page and we need to be able to bring it back in. So how can we do that? Well, let's start by coming here and doing something. So we're gonna say nav toggle and we're gonna do an add event listener and that event listener will be a click. So we're saying, you know, go look at this guy, find this mobile nav toggle and when we're gonna listen for a click on it, we're, we're keeping our ear open. And when somebody clicks on it, we want something to happen. So we're gonna do a function here. And so I'm just going to do uh, this and then this, <laughs> which is an arrow function in JavaScript. So we're going to create it, or uh, we're just going to do this within our thing here. We'll see if we break this off into its own function or not. Uh, but I think we can just do this because it's not going to be too complicated. Um, and we don't really need to, we don't care. Like often you'll see things like E here or even like event, um, or you might be adding in certain things, but we don't really need it in this case. It doesn't matter uh, what was clicked on. So we're just doing a an, sort of an empty arrow function to say do something. And so nav toggle, add event listener, click. And so because we're using JavaScript to manipulate this, we're gonna be turning something on and off. This is where I like using data attributes. And so we're gonna go over to my index and we're gonna find my primary navigation right here. And we're gonna add one more thing to this, which is going to be data visible is equal to false. And so this is a data attribute, if you haven't used them before, is a custom attribute that you can create. And they're often used for JavaScript purposes. So you're sort of saying this is hooking into JavaScript, uh, might be manipulated with the JavaScript, and it's making, uh, uh, yeah, I'm using that to, to play around with what's happening here. So data visible is equal to false. And because I have this attribute in here that I'm gonna be using my JavaScript to manipulate, I can also come into my CSS and manipulate and take advantage of that. So here I can say that my primary navigation has with, if my primary navigation has the attribute of data, data visible, visible is equal to true. And I put quotations here that I don't want. We can just do that. Um, so if the primary navigation has data visible is equal to true, we're actually going to transform it so it comes back out and we can do a 0% on that. That just means now we have to use my JavaScript to switch this data visible false because right now it's not actually visible, it's hiding off the screen. And when we click, we wanna switch that over to true so it slides out. And then that will slide out because my CSS here is telling it to. So let's come to here, it's, like, it's gonna pop out and we'll eventually make it slide out. So what we wanna do is if somebody clicks on it, we wanna check is it actually visible or not. So let's come up with uh, something in here. We're gonna say const visibility is equal to, and I'm surprised I didn't misspell that, but here we go. Uh, const visibility is equal to, and do nav.get attribute. And in the get attribute, you just tell it what attribute you want. So we want my data visible, which is the attribute that we put on there. So let's just see what happens now uh, with, with this. When we click on it, we're gonna get the attribute. 
So let's do a console log of visibility. And let's open up, let's, I have my dev tools open over here, so let's bring them on over. And now if I click on this, oh, nav is not defined. Uh, I, did, I put nav, we wanted primary nav. Sorry about that. I want to get the attribute on my primary nav of visibility. So let's come back here and click again, and now it's false. Why is it false? And every time I click, I get a false, because if we look in our HTML, the data visible is equal to false. So it's giving us this value here. Now, one thing that's really important is this is a string and not a Boolean value that it's getting. Uh, it would be nice if it was a Boolean, but it is actually a string. So just so you know. Um, and if you don't know the difference, don't stress about it too much right now, but it is just, uh, but yeah, it's a string. So it's gonna change how we write our, our statements here a little bit. So we're gonna say, uh, then we know it's false right now. And if it is false, we wanna switch it to true. So if visibility uh, is equal to tr uh, false, the current state. And when I said before um, that it was a string, it just means like if I put false like this, it's a Boolean value, it's actually false. Whereas here it's returning a string, so it's like written text, it doesn't actually, and we, you could actually convert that to the Boolean, but whatever. Um, to me, it's easy enough just to do this. So if visibility is equal to the string of false, what do we wanna do? We want that primary nav. Instead of get attribute, we're gonna do a set attribute. And same idea, we can say data visible. And then to set an attribute here, when we did the get attribute, we just said get attribute and get this because it's getting the value for it. But now we wanna set the attribute. So we're choosing data visible and then we have to say what we wanna actually set it to. So we put a comma and then what do we wanna set that value to? We wanna set it over to true. So now if I hit save on that and you'll notice my quotation marks are changing just cause I have prettier running. Um, so it, fixed thing, it fixes things like that to me. Um, so if I misspelled visibility, the reason I know I misspelled visibility is see how it's dark here and then um, like it's faded out a little bit. If I spelled it right, <laughs> now it comes in because it goes, oh, you set this and then you're actually using it somewhere. Whereas if you make a spelling mistake, it fades it out because it goes, this isn't actually being used anywhere. Do you really need it? Um, so there we go, <laughs> we can fix it like that. So now if I click, it should appear, <sighs> it worked but now it doesn't close. So then we could say else if visibility is equal to true. Uh, and you don't need this part. You could just say else and it would be exactly the same thing because we only have a true or false that we can be getting at this point. Um, but I'm just writing this to be really explicit. So if you were to come across this code, you'd know exactly what's happening. But um, if you prefer being a little bit, you know, we could just say else like that. So. Um, else, if the visibility is equal to true, then we want to switch that around. Primary nav dot set attribute, and then my data visible will be false. Uh, and you'll notice I am putting them in here without the string on it. It still ends up turning it into a string, so it should work just fine. And look at that, it opens and closes. Now there is another really important thing we want to do here before we add the animation. And that is when I created this, if you remember on the button, we had this area expanded is equal to false. And we need that to say true when the menus actually open. We took all this time to add these things in here. We should set them up and use them properly. So the other thing we can do here is my nav toggle set attribute. So this is my area expanded. So when nav toggle set attribute area expanded, is currently uh, false, right? We have area expanded is equal. So it's currently false. So we also want that one to become true. And then we can just copy this line and this one will become false when we close it back the other way. That's working. And if you we dive into the DOM and we go and take a look, um, I've commented a whole bunch of stuff out. <laughs> Uh, so it wouldn't get in our way, but we can see here my button area expanded is equal to false and when I click on that it switches over to true right there and we can see it's going back and forth as I click on that so we know that that's actually working. Amazing, perfect, we're rocking rolling right now. We can add in our nice little animation. So the animation's nice and easy. We're doing a transform so we can just do a transition and transform and say 350, 300, say 350 milliseconds ease in. Um, so then it should, 
Uh, actually, I like ease out better, not ease in. I'll do an ease out. You could play with your your you know different things to get this to look nicer. You could do your cubic beziers and other stuff to do some nicer animations, but I think that works perfectly fine, and I'm really happy with that. And once again, we can go big and then go back small, and there we go. That's looking pretty nice. So I'm really happy with that. The last thing though that we obviously want is um, the design did come with an X that we're replacing this with. Now this is an SVG, so if you wanted to, you could even come in and like play with that SVG, have it as an inline SVG and animate things. I'm not doing that for this one because uh, it did give us a closed version as well. So I'm just going to use that. Uh, and that's because my mobile nav toggle happened to be using the um, icon hamburger here. And we just took the time to go and set our area expanded to true or false. So we can help reinforce that accessibility of having it set up properly by coming in and saying that the mobile nav toggle, if it has an area expanded, is equal to true on there, we can change the background image. Um, and actually, you know what, I'm going to write back. I, I've come to really starting to write background image instead of using the shorthand, just because uh, every now and then shorthands can get you into trouble. And this, I think, is either closed or closed. So we'll try close first. And oh, we got it right. Um, and that's where huh, my back, putting the, the long hand actually got me into more trouble. Because before, this was overwriting everything because it's the shorthand of background. Uh, so it actually overwrote the background color as well. So we'll just say um, background color is transparent, tra not transition, transparent. And there we go. So now we get the X and then it switches over and back and forth. Background image is not something that you can animate. Um, so we can't do a transition or anything there to like whatever you might want to do. You can even do like a sprite here, I guess too, but that would be weird if it would like slide around. I don't think that would work. I'm happy with that. I think it's perfectly fine. And my mobile navigation is looking pretty good. And now we just need to tackle it at larger screen sizes. Um, in the actual version from Front End Mentor, we actually turn these numbers off at the medium screen size. And then we turn them back on at the larger screen size. And sorry, I'm just looking for Figma right now. I had to open it up. So you can see we have the numbers here. And then when we get to their, their medium screen size, they turn the numbers off. And then when we get to the large screen size, the numbers turn back on. And that's kind of an interesting approach. And it's one that you don't see, um, it, it's kind of interesting, it's on, off, and then back on. So because of that, this is one of, I've said already, like I don't use a lot of max widths, but I definitely do for my uh, navigations. I wanna look at this just in case. I said this is something that's not specific to this, but it's something I think is a good lesson um, in general. So, and you might have situations like this where you get different breakpoints across different, you know, at several different sizes. And we're going to do a uh, min width of 35M and max width. And I'll go with like a 55M. I did it smaller in um, the, the Scrimba course, but I'm going to do 55 here. And this is meaning, and let, let's just change here. We'll do primary navigation. We're going to set the background to red just so we can see what's happening here. Background of red. And so that means here we don't have it right? Because we're not between 35 and the 55 that I set. Then we hit that breakpoint and it switches over to here. So now we have the red background, but then when I hit that 55 at one point, it disappears and turns back off. Now I don't want to be changing my background. What I actually want to be doing is coming onto this and saying that my, um, what was it called again? It was, um, I did, I'm going to use the same selector that I used before just to make sure it's consistent and it was an area hidden. Um, or this was even like a span with area hidden. We could just do area hidden, I guess, but we'll keep it. I think that's exactly how I had it um, before. So I'm gonna do that. And then this would just be a display of none. So they disappear at that size. So here they're visible, they disappear. So those numbers turn off. And then when we get to a small enough size, the numbers uh, turn back on. So there we go. And then there we go. And they switch back on there. So. I think that works really well. You see my font sizes are changing a bit. That's just from the default styles I had set up before. Um, but I'm pretty happy with that. So now we can jump up to the largest size and come here and say at media, and we'll do a min width of 55M. So we're going, this was like 35 and smaller then between 35 and 55. And now we're saying 35 and bigger and or 55 and bigger, I should say. And we can come and add some styles here as well. Uh, and actually I'm gonna do a 35 here. 
And I think most of them can actually fit in this 35. I was going to do only 55, but if we look at things like the padding and all of that, like they're the same across the board with everything. So I think we can actually do it here. So primary navigation. Um, let's add some padding on this guy. So we can say padding is, uh, let's just try one rem and see what that looks like. And I'm pretty happy on the top and the bottom how that's looking. Maybe it could be a little bit bigger. And I actually have another thing that's setting that distance um, on there that I don't have that would be in the demo. But for this one, uh, if you if you follow along in front in my the Scrimba course itself, um, I actually take a different approach for creating that space. But I think for this demo, this actually makes more sense um, to look at it this way. So I'm pretty happy with the space. Uh, actually, let's bring that up to two, and we get yeah, that looks a lot better. Uh, and then we want the space on the left and the right. So I'm actually going to do this one just to make it uh, on two lines. It's going to make it easier to write. So we're going to use another logical property, which is my padding block, which is my top and my bottom padding. So we can see it's only doing the top and the bottom. So then I can come and do some padding in line. And we're going to do a clamp on this one, full of modern CSS. We've looked at min, we're looking at logical properties, and now we're going to come in with a clamp. And clamp's always like something you just have to finick around with a little bit. Uh, we're going to do clamp of 3rem. I'm going to hit save. It's going to work. <laughs> um, oh, it doesn't even work. I thought that would work if you only had one value. Okay, whatever. Um, I want that. We're going to say a maximum of 10, and I want a middle value here. And let's start with 5 viewport width. And what that means is we're, we're setting things up so the smallest my padding in line, so my left and my right padding, the smallest they can get is three rem. The biggest they can get to is 10, which is probably too big. And then this five is the growth factor and we're like the ideal width. So here we're at the smallest size. It's not, it's growing a little bit. Let's make this a bigger number. Uh, let's try 10. You can already see that made a big difference on there. So now here you can actually see that padding on the left and the right. I mean, I know things are jumping because it's moving around. But that padding on the left and the right is actually changing. But what's happening is it will never get smaller than three or bigger than 10. So as this stretches across, at one point, if you had a really big viewport, it's not going to just keep stretching and stretching and stretching. It locks in a little bit, which I think is pretty realistic to this, um, this layout that we're trying to get, where it's sort of the two sides should be about the same. They sort of lock in. Now, the one issue is the space in between. We already talked a little bit about that. So we can come in and change my gap property here. And you know what? I think if this is going to be three, that looks pretty good. Um, so if I have three here and I was using three here, I think, or maybe it was two. So if they're different, then I guess it makes sense to have them um, separated a little bit. Um, so I'm pretty happy with that. The one issue here is my logo is bumping into there, like they're touching each other right now. Um, so that could be playing around with some of these numbers. Maybe this could actually get smaller. Maybe this gap actually becomes a clamp. So we could say the minimum is like a 1.5 rem, then it's gonna go at a five viewport width, and the maximum is going to be the three rem that we finished at. Just so as the screen gets smaller, you can see that like the space between those is actually allowed to grow and shrink a little bit as well. And that means at that one, it's really close, but my logo doesn't crash into it. And again, maybe these numbers you also play around with. The viewport units, when you're doing this, you do it, it's a little finicky and just takes a little bit of playing around with the number um, to get to something that you really like and you just sort of get there eventually. It's sort of magic numbery, which isn't ideal, but it gets the job done at the end of the day. And there we go. We have a navigation that looks good there. We can shrink down, we can close it, we can open it, and we can make it bigger, and it works perfectly well here as well. And one thing that you will notice, or I'm sure I'll get comments on, is if we're here and we shrink down, you get that, which isn't the ideal situation. I'll put a link to a CSS Tricks article down below that looks at how we can use JavaScript to disable the animations when the page is resizing. But just know that the only people who resize pages when they're actually on the page tend to be developers. So most people uh, would never even notice that happens. But if that is a deal breaker, there are ways of disabling the animations while the page is resizing. So you could add that in yourself. And if you were trying to follow along to get this exact navigation with this line here, and you want to see more about this page and everything, again, this is a front end mentor project that's completely free, including all the Figma files and everything else. So you can check out all the design assets and everything you need at Front End Mentor, linked down below. And I did almost this entire site as a free course over on Scrimbo, where I look at how we can add this line in, we add the active states and do a lot more like that. 
Once again, the link for that is down below for you to go and check out. And with that, a really big thank you to my supporters of awesome over on Patreon, Stuart, Randy, and Johnny, and of course, all my other patrons as well for their monthly support. And until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.